thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to jump into this. We're in our uh, sixth week of a series called Grave Robber. And we're basing it loosely around uh, Mark Batterson's book called Grave Robber. I'm not teaching you the book, so I'd really encourage you to get a copy of it. Pick up a copy on Amazon or whatever. Uh, it's really good. Mark Batterson is an amazing storyteller, and it's full, full, full of living examples of, of the different uh, people who experience miracles in different ways. And so uh, that's what we're talking about, and you can pick that up on Amazon or CBD or wherever, wherever you purchase your books. Uh, but uh, we're in the book of John, and if you have... Uh, the Version Bible app on your... Okay, it's telling me it's Outbreak Service. Yes, I know that. I didn't think it was something else. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, if you've got your Version Bible app, you can open that up and it will say live event and uh, the Outbreak Church will come up there. You can pull that up right out of the, the list. It'll give you the um, sermon notes and those different type things there. But this is just an amazing, it's been a great series. The subtitle of this is How Jesus Can Make Your Impossible Possible. Isn't that what we need? <laughs> we spend our lives facing impossible stuff. And Jesus, that amazing king that we just sung about, can make our impossible possible. And this series we've been looking at is showing us... Um, John is focusing on, on seven particular signs here in the book of John, and that's what we're looking at, these seven miraculous signs um, or miracles of Jesus found in the book of John, but more importantly, showing that they're not just stuff that happened that Jesus did a long time ago. Folks, this is stuff Jesus wants to do in your life now. Who needs a miracle in here? I mean, I do. <laughs> you know, I do. Some people are going to tell you the miracle stopped after the book of Acts. I don't believe that. We've seen too many miracles right here, physical healings, spiritual healings, relational healings, all kind of stuff. We've seen that right here in this church. And, uh, and I, can't, I can't agree with the, the fact that some people are going to tell you that uh, healings stopped after the book of Acts. But uh, John, I love what he does here. He chooses to call these signs because um, he, he doesn't call them miracles because these are more like signposts pointing people to that divine power behind each of these, and that's the power of God. The, every one of these people was just in desperate need, and the power of God is what took them and captured them and helped them in that need. Okay? So when you're in that desperate need, Quit looking to Facebook, quit looking to everywhere else, stop turning on Oprah and Dr. Phil, and just turn to God. Okay, now some of you are looking like, well, I go to Jerry Springer. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool, you know. <laughs> if, you know, if, 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 that, if that floats your boat, then it's got a hole in it, but it'll be all right, it'll, it'll be all right. So, so far, just like the... Uh, the little video bumper said, we've seen Jesus appear in lots of different forms and, and the first sign showed Jesus is the winemaker. And that just tells us that Jesus cares about the little things. He cares about this groom who was about to lose his, uh, his standing in the community because he ran out of wine. That was a big guffaw back then. And so he helped. Uh, and also the second sign, we saw Jesus as the choreographer. And I just love that, the way that Jesus just teaches us and puts the moves in place and creates this beautiful dance that, that we're a part of. And he puts the right people at the right place together. And we saw that as Jesus healed the, the Roman uh, ruler's son who was 20 miles away. Jesus didn't even have to go there. Just with his word, just with his word, healed him. Um, we looked at Jesus being the rule breaker. He healed a guy on the Sabbath, which was, ooh. Jesus created the Sabbath. He can do whatever he wants to. If he wants to cut grass on the Sabbath, he can. It don't matter. He created it. But the people around him, he was a huge rule breaker. And quite frankly, sometimes if you're going to experience a miracle, you've got to be willing to break a few rules. Now, I don't mean like, you know, if you want to experience a miracle, don't go out here and drive, you know, 90 miles an hour down 72. 
because uh, most people don't do that anyway. Most people drive 37 miles an hour <laughs> in a 55 zone. And there's a preacher behind them giving them a one-finger salute all the way. No, I'm playing. I don't do that. I don't do that. But uh, anyway. Uh, and then uh, last week, I love this, uh, Lord Algebra. His, his, he just takes stuff and multiplies it. He just multiplies it. And remember, the Scripture says that uh, he fed 5,000 men. Well, if you put all that together, that's, tw that's about 20,000 people, kids and wives and everybody, okay? So... Uh, uh, so, you know, that, that in itself is a huge miracle. And today we're going to see Jesus as the water walker. You ever seen one of those little things on the pond? And it's actually called a water walker. It's some kind of little critter that is so light that it, you know, scoots across the top of the pond. Well, let me just let you in on something. Ain't a one of us that light. Okay? <laughs> only Jesus is the human who can do that. Okay? He's the only one. And so today we're going to see that even in the midst of incredible resistance in the storms of your life and that are just going on around you when you're at the end of your rope, you can trust God who holds the very... He created nature. You can trust the God who created that. And if listen, if God can create the Milky Way just by... or if He can create the Grand Canyon with a drop of water... Don't you think he can enter into your life and help with your problems? Yeah, he can. He can. So let's pick this up. Shortly after, in fact, this is right after the miracle that we talked about last week, uh, the sign of feeding all those people. Another miracle takes place, and it's later on that evening. So let's pick this up here. Let's look at the place, first of all. What I'm trying to do each time is give you the, the, the cultural and historical and the the logistical background behind this thing. So Jesus had just fed all those people. And as you recall, they still don't understand that Jesus is not going to come in and save them from the Romans. They're still expecting a political Messiah to come in and save them. Okay? So, but when they see him do all this stuff, they're like, this guy really is that Messiah that's going to free us from the Romans. Okay? And so... Uh, Jesus knew that they were about to come get him and, and force him into a political issue that he, wasn't, that he was not interested in. So, like any good guy, he heads up to the top of the mountain. I just love that. He just goes up the mountain to get away from them. And so John picks up the fifth uh, sign right there with the detail. So let's start reading uh, with verse 16. We're in chapter 6 of John, verse 16, and the one's on the screen, and, and I'll be reading to you from the uh, uh, Christian standard. So here we go. Verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. That's the Sea of Galilee. Got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. Darkness had already set in, but Jesus had not yet come to them. Then a high wind arose and the sea began to churn. Okay. So apparently... The disciples had been down there on the shore waiting for Jesus to show up. They knew he went up on the mountain. And so it was getting late, and he had already told them to go to the other side. So they said, okay, we leave without him. If he misses it, he misses it. Let him catch a cab. Okay? Call an Uber. So they, they sail off without him. And John describes a very important thing here uh, in their departure, he says, darkness had already set in, but Jesus had not come to them. And listen, to be honest with you, the Sea of Galilee has changed very little in those 2,000 years since Jesus walked around it. If, if, if you follow the scripture, you'll know a lot of his ministry was around the Sea of Galilee. And he walked around it. That's where he recruited a lot of his, uh, his guys. Look at this picture of the Sea of Galilee. Okay, that's the Sea of Galilee today from up on a mountain. Okay, that's it today. So, I want you to think about this. Somewhere out there, maybe there's a little tiny boat with uh, 12 guys in it rowing like crazy, all right? And Jesus is somewhere up here on this mountain, okay? So just think about that. And it's a, it's a heart-shaped lake. It's very picturesque. It's up in northern Israel. And the cool thing about this, it's one of the lowest-lying bodies of water in the world. It's 680 feet below sea level. And... The trip across the Sea of Galilee is really only six or seven miles. 
okay? Um, but it can be one of the most dangerous trips anybody could take, especially in a boat, because the mount, it, it, um, geologically or whatever you want to call it, the way the mountains are situated around the Sea of Galilee combined with its being 680 degrees below sea level and then where it's located between the mountains and the uh, Mediterranean Sea, there's a lot of stuff. And the, trust me, the warm air comes in, yada, 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 all that kind of stuff. Watch, watch the news if you want to know about that kind of stuff. But anyway, what happens is when that hits, the cool air coming off the mountain, warm air coming in, creates these massive storms, and they create right over the Sea of Galilee. Just in a skinny minute, it'll happen. It'll happen like that. And so it'll instantly turn a calm, peaceful uh, uh, lake into a, a raging sea. And that's the scene here. The sea gets choppy. Now look at this picture right here. This is actually the Sea of Galilee. Okay? So that's what these guys are facing. And they started out on smooth as glass. And then all of a sudden this comes up and they're facing this kind of thing. Now I don't know about you, I wouldn't want to be in that in a, a motorboat, let alone a rowboat. Okay? Uh, just trying to row through that thing. And... In fact, it's so choppy and so, so messed up that these guys have been rowing most of the night and they've only made it halfway across. So, now look at this. This is an artist's rendition here. And, uh, yeah, flip that off. Uh, go to that next slide. There we go. You can't see it. It's so hard and dark. But this is an artist's rendition of the guys in the boat there. And it's just it's, it's hard to see, but that's kind of like what it really was like. Okay, that's kind of really what it was like there. So I just wonder what these guys were thinking as they were in that, just rowing. It's kind of like that movie, The Perfect Storm. Remember, uh, just trying to go up that thing. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine that. But think about what these guys were thinking as they were out there, and probably what they were hollering at each other back and forth up and down the boat. This is, this is the inner core, the, the, the inner circle, if you will. These 12 guys had been spending some major intense time with Jesus, 24-7 to be exact, and they, they watched how Jesus acted with people. They watched how he reacted with people. And they've seen some pretty doggone amazing stuff happen. First, you know, not to mention water into wine and uh, all that other stuff. And the latest one was just this afternoon when Jesus fed about 20,000 people with virtually nothing, with a happy meal, basically. Okay? And then he picked up 12 basketfuls and fed everybody else, too. They've seen all that. They've been with Jesus. They're, they're in the middle of this lake. And they still ain't got figured, Jesus figured out. They can't figure this guy out. And they're saying, is, is this really the Messiah that we were told about in the Scriptures? Now keep in mind, they too were still thinking political Messiah. They were putting all their hopes in a political system. Ah. I don't care what yours is, when you put all your hopes in it, you done lost. Is this the guy, and, and, you know, to be really honest with you, he's not the picture of the king that they've been thinking about for all these years. You know, they're thinking some king coming in riding on a chariot and, and you know, just blah, 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 all this kind of stuff, kind of Ben Hur-esque, you know. Um, and even in spite of all the hours and sweat equity and everything else and all the signs they've seen, they still are not really sure that just Jesus is who they're looking for. But then... Something happens that really defies their belief. You know, and I think about, okay, well, you know, yeah, maybe he could have just done something and changed that water into wine or somehow, you know, I don't know. They don't know how all that bread got changed into feed 20,000 people. But, you know, it could be, maybe, maybe it could be done. I don't know. Penn and Teller can do it. I don't know. You know, so it's, it'll, it'll happen. It'll happen. Chris Isaac or Chris, uh, what's his name? Chris Angel. Chris Angel, mind freak. He could do it. You know, he can pull a hair out of his chest nine feet long. So I don't know. He can do anything. He can do that stuff. So, um, but, uh, so that's what they're thinking. You know, maybe he's just another one of them guys that does that kind of stuff. But this next thing, guys, I, and you've got to understand this, this next thing is what absolutely defies their explanation. It defies nature. It defies everything they've ever been taught. 
And it gives them a very clear indication of something they'd never seen before. And, and it's almost like Jesus is saying, I'm the guy. Okay? They finally get an idea of who this guy is. And I want us to look at and break this one miracle down. This is actually what, what I like to call a 3D miracle because it's, it's actually one miracle, but it's three separate miracles that each deal with a different dimension. So it's a three-dimension miracle. So let's look at this. First of all is the miracle of distance. Okay, the miracle of distance. Look at verse 19, the first part of verse 19. After they had rode about three or four miles. Okay, so... The disciples were three or four miles out in the middle of this lake, storm beating them to death, that, this crazy thing going on. Even for experienced fishermen like this, guys, this would have been very, very dangerous, extremely dangerous. They were working so hard, rowing against the waves, and, and Matthew tells us that they were actually in the midst of the sea, which means they were way off course. They started up on the northeastern shore, and they were going to cut across the, to the the northern end of the lake to get to the other side. But after they had been chased by the wind and all this other stuff, they ended up in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And they were just struggling just valiantly, but vainly, to get out of this storm. Maybe you're in a storm right now and you've just been struggling valiantly to get out of it. But everything you're doing ain't working. And I don't know what your storm is. But you feel just like these guys. Man, I've been rowing and my arms are tired and I'm angry and I'm just... Uh, and whatever you're trying is not working. So now if you add that to that scene, uh, if you drop back to the book of Mark, which you don't have to, I'll give it to you right here. Mark gives us some more in this account. Listen to what he says. This is coming from Mark uh, chapter 6. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and Jesus was alone on the land. Now listen. He saw them being battered as they rowed because the wind was against them. Around three in the morning, he came toward them walking on the sea and wanted to pass them by. All right? Now, you put all those clues together, and Jesus is up on a mountain three and a half to four miles away from them, and he can see them rowing. Boy had good glasses. That's all I can say. That in itself is a miracle. You know, that is an absolute miracle. So here's a, here's a thought for us. Jesus sees you in your deepest storm no matter how far you are away from Jesus. I'm just going to let that hang here just a minute. Hear what I said? No matter how far you are away from Jesus, Jesus sees you in your worst storm. And then this is just fun for me. I just love this. And he intended, he wanted to pass them by. So I'm thinking, you know, Jesus is like walking on the water. Yo, boys, what's up? See you over yonder. <laughs> you know, I just, I just love it, man. Jesus is walking on like he's going to head on out. But he changes his mind, of course. We know that story. Okay. So they're straining at the oars and, and they're just pulling and Jesus sees them from on top of that mountain three and a half, four miles away. And let me read you a quote here from Mark Batterson. I love this. Batterson says, The disciples had crossed the same sea earlier that day, hiked up a mountainside and waited on a dinner party of 20,000. Then Jesus asked them to work the night shift by rowing back across the Sea of Galilee. The disciples were at the end of their rope, at the end of themselves, but that's when you're getting close to a miracle. The disciples were fighting a losing battle. Listen, if you're fighting cancer, fighting for your marriage, there are days when you feel beaten by waves of discouragement. Or maybe you're drowning in a sea of debt. I know it's a sinking feeling. Listen to what he says. But you cannot have a comeback without a setback. Oh boy, I wish I had written that. You cannot have a comeback without a setback. And then he goes on to say, remember what we said at the outset. Everybody wants a miracle, but nobody wants to be in a situation that necessitates one. We want smooth sailing, but that's sailing away from miracles. The prerequisite is often a perfect storm. And it's at that moment when you feel helpless and hopeless, when God's omnipotence overwhelms your impotence like a 50-foot tsunami. Hmm. So the miracle of distance. 
the miracle of distance. Are you at the end of your rope? Are you struggling? Jesus sees that. Jesus sees that. Next, look at the miracle of gravity. Okay? It, God tried to tell me one time, and, and actually he was, he was talking to a friend of mine and, and myself, and uh, he said, uh, I don't believe in absolute truth. Yeah, absolute truth is truth is the right for all, the same for all people, all places, all times. And uh, my friend Vody Balkum told a guy, I said, go up yonder on top of the roof. He said, why? He said, because I want you to go up there and step off. He said, you absolutely going to bust your tail because gravity is going to pull you down. That was supposed to be a joke, guys. That's right. <laughs> all right. What he's saying, thank you. What he's saying is, you know, <laughs> absolute truth, gravity is an absolute truth. If you step off the side of the building, you're going to fall. Okay? And gravity, gravity, it just, it just, we can't get away from it unless we go up in space. I know. Okay? But look what he says here, starting at verse 19, that second half of 19 and 20. Um, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. He was coming near the boat, and they were afraid. Uh, but he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. I don't know about you, but if I was in the middle of that storm and I saw a, a human figure walking on the ocean toward me in the middle of that storm, I would be afraid to. One, uh, one of the other gospels says they thought it was a ghost. Okay? They were scared out of their wits. Uh, so Jesus walking on the water, and the thing is, he wasn't walking a few yards. Okay, He was walking uh, three and a half miles out into, think that picture with those waves, okay, he was walking three and a half miles in that. And now, you know, to be honest with you, some of the great Jewish leaders and prophets, God had parted the waters through them and they were able to walk across on dry land, uh, people like Mo uh, Moses and Joshua. But none of those guys had ever defied gravity by walking on top of the water. God had to split the water and they walked through on dry land. Jesus was walking on top of of the water. We go to Hunting Island a lot, and Hunting Island's kind of washing away, and as it washes away, um, it's, it's taking some of the sand out here and putting it out in the channel. Well, at, at certain parts of the day, it's really strange looking because the, you're sitting on the beach, and you don't realize there's a sandbar like almost a mile out in the ocean out there, and I, I, we were down there not long ago, and I asked Cindy, or so I said, is that a human out there? And sure enough, there's this guy standing out there a mile in the ocean. He's walking. And I'm like, Lord, help me. Jesus has returned. Thank you, Jesus. All right. But it wasn't. It was just some guy who was going out there looking at shells. And, and we realized that the sandbar now is up to where they can literally walk on it at that time of the tide. But it's so weird looking. I mean, it's just like a person walking on water. But it ain't water. He's walking on sand. That ain't what happened here. Now, people are going to try to tell you that that kind of thing happened. They're also going to try to tell you that certain times of the year there are ice flows that actually can appear in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus was walking on ice flows. Now, I don't know whether it's more of a miracle to walk through that storm or to skate across ice flows. I don't know. Either way, it's a miracle. Okay? It's a miracle. All right? But... Jesus was on top of the world. Listen, si the laws of science and the laws of physics say that is impossible. We serve a God who is the master of impossible. Okay, so let's just get that in our head. All we want to do whenever life throws us a curve, we say it's impossible. Yes, it's impossible, but God is going to make your impossible possible. I love, again, a quote from Batterson. The most astonishing may be the fifth miracle in John's gospel when Jesus turned the white caps into red carpet. And this was no hop, skip, and jump. The water walker covered at least three and a half miles. At an average walking pace of three miles an hour, this miracle most likely lasted 70 minutes. Okay? So why did he do this? Why didn't he just go on and pass them by? Why didn't he even, why, he could have just poof, teleported himself to the other side, couldn't he? He's Jesus. He can do anything. Okay, why did he do this? Okay, Jesus met them walking on the water for the same reason he fed those 20,000 people. So the disciples could see his power and understand who he is. That's the point. But when they see Jesus out there, they are scared to death. And, the, and here's the thing. 
they're no longer afraid of the storm. They're afraid of Jesus. Because they say, who is this guy? And they recognize that this, they're, they're actually witnessing deity in action. They're actually witnessing God in action. They've seen something so far beyond the natural thing, they can't, they can't understand it. And they're, they're confronted with this whole thing in their head like this don't make no sense and this is crazy and we can't even understand this. But here's the great thing. Like I said, right here in the middle of this storm, they're not, they're not afraid of the storm anymore. They're fearing God. And at this very moment, right in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, right in the middle of the storm, they are confronted by a power that is beyond their human reckoning. Guys, listen, when we meet Jesus face to face for real, you are confronted by a power beyond your human reckoning. When God works miracles in your life, it is something that you cannot understand. It is beyond human reckoning. whether that's a physical healing or a financial healing or a relational healing, you can't figure it out. And they saw the power of God and they realized this was God in the flesh. And guys, when you meet Jesus like that, you're going to be taken back. You know, I told them back there, we were in the green room back there praying and it, it just happened to be the, the conversation turned to chiggers, okay? If you don't know what a chigger is, you ain't from South Carolina, so that's all right. But chiggers are these little bugs you get. And I used to joke all the time about, about when I get to heaven, the first thing I want to ask God is, why would you make chiggers? But a friend of mine told me, no, you're not. You're going to be so overwhelmed by the Spirit of Jesus, you're going to fall on your face, and you won't be able to do nothing but blubber. And I said, you're right. It was just a joke, dude. I mean, just, you know, let up, man. <laughs> let up. That's what you get when you try to joke with a guy who has a doctorate in theology. You know, just trust me, don't go there. Don't go there, all right? But, but, you know, seriously, but he is serious. Guys, when you meet Jesus, man, you can't do nothing but just, it's overwhelming. And if, listen, and if you think you can understand Jesus, then you're missing the point. You're missing the point. Jesus, and here's, here's the way Jesus does this. And he did it with them, he does it with us. Jesus calmed the fears of those disciples by showing his true identity to them in the middle of the storm. And guys, listen, that's what he's going to do to us. He's going to, rev he's going to show you who he is in the middle of your storm. When that doctor has told you cancer and you've got six weeks left, that's the storm Jesus is going to stand up in. That's when you need to start listening to Jesus more than you start listening to your doctor. When the bank says, we're going to come take your house and your car and everything else, that's the middle of that storm. And Jesus is going to stand up in the middle of that storm and he's going to reveal himself to you in ways that you can't understand. If you can understand it, listen, it ain't a miracle. All right? So, let's keep going here. And I love this. It, when you first read this scripture, it kind of looks like he's he kind of walking by and, he, and he's coming up to him. He says, don't worry, guys, it's only me. I got this. But that's not what it is here. This, is, this wording is very, very important. John is a master at, at showing us and, and bringing out the, the nuances underneath the Hebrew language and the Greek language. Uh, when Jesus said, uh, it is I, in the Greek, those three words are actually only two. So what Jesus really said is he said, I am. So listen, in the middle of your storm, Jesus is going to stand up and say, I am. I am. I am. Okay. That is a direct reference to the deity of Jesus Christ. Remember when God revealed his name to Moses? He said, I am that I am, and that abbreviation, uh, uh, became the, the Hebrew word for I am, and that's what the word for God is in Hebrew is I am. He says, I am. And listen, those guys understood that. When, the, when he said, I am, I mean, I mean, just can you imagine all 12 of those guys? He is quoting and he is saying, I am God. That's got to be life-changing. 
When you hear God say, when you hear Jesus say, I am God, it is life changing. And it changes your life, regardless of the storm you're in. Then I love the next thing. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He's saying, don't be afraid of the storm and don't be afraid of me. Okay? Man, we, we, he comes to these guys out in the middle of the sea, in the middle of this storm, and, and I know I've said this before, but it's not trite and it's not cliche. It is true. Guys, man, when, when we are in... We are, in the middle of our storm, we are facing storms. We are doing everything we can do to get out of these storms. We are the emotional storms, spiritual storms, and we're just like them in that we just feel like we are tossed around in this, this massive, perfect storm that's going on. And, and listen, I just want to tell you this. In spite of whatever circumstances are going on, if you trust in the one who is God, who says, I am, if you put your trust in him for safekeeping, he's going to give you peace in any storm. Now, did I say he's going to take the storm away? No. He's going to give you peace in any storm. If we, in spite of our circumstances, great quote from Mark Batterson. Instead of, a, listen to this, this is, I love the way this guy writes. Instead of allowing circumstances to get between you and God, faith is putting God between you and your circumstances. And we do it the other way around all the time. Let's go to the third miracle, the third, uh, third D of this. It's the miracle of space and time. All right? Look at verse 21. It says, Then they were willing, somebody say willing, to take him on board, and at once the boat was at the shore where they were headed. Boom. Beam me up, Scotty. You know? And Ma Matthew's account, just so you'll know kind of where this falls in, Matthew's account has the, uh, about the storm tells us the episode of Peter walking on the water right before they, Jesus got in the boat with him. But we're going to save that for a whole other series, Okay? But the part that's so missed in this is, is in verse 21. It says, Then they were willing to take him on board. And at once the boat was on the shore where they were going. This is the second time in these miracles that John has used the word immediately. Okay? And if those words are to be taken literally, that means that they traveled over three miles in the blink of an eye. That is totally against anything space and time and, and physics and anything else will tell you. And, and I, I can only imagine that they're probably glad it was dark that night. Could you imagine what it would feel like and look like if they were doing that in the daytime? I mean, at least if it was dark, they couldn't see what was happening. Okay? Now, John doesn't particularly tell us right here whether Jesus got in the boat or not, but Matthew and Mark say he did. Okay? And, but here's what I want you to understand. That boat immediately ended up where they were going. Immediately ended up where they're going. And that immediate and that miraculous uh, arrival of that boat on the other shore happened simultaneously, listen, with their willingness to let Jesus in and Jesus stepping in. Matthew and Mark say, immediately when he stepped in, the wind stopped. Are you willing to let... Jesus is going to step into your storm if you ask him. But he's a polite Savior. He's not going to bust up in your storm if you don't want him to. But are you willing to let him into your storm? I'm so... Listen, I'm so bullheaded. Y'all know me. I've, I've told Jesus a hundred times, I got this, God. You just sit up there and enjoy, I got this. And then, you know, three days later, when I'm getting ready to strangle myself, he says, how'd that work out for you? You ready for me to work on this thing a little bit? Now? And boom, it happens. It happens. So the lesson is real clear here in this part of it. Guys, when we welcome Jesus into our lives, he is going to come into your life. Some of you are trying to play both sides of this fence. You know, I want Jesus in my life, but I'm not willing to welcome him into my life. Mm -hmm. 
when Jesus comes in, when we are willing to let him into our lives, into our boat, okay, he's going to come in. Like I said, those storms may not stop, but he's with us during the storm. He is in the boat with us in the storm. I love that old song that says, sometimes he calms the storm, sometimes he calms the child. You know, sometimes we need the God of the angel armies that goes out there and kicks butt and takes names for us. Boom, 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 boom. You know, sometimes we need that God of the angel armies. Sometimes I need my heavenly daddy, my papa, my abba, who's going to pick me up in his big old arms, brush this old gray hair out of my face and say, Scott, daddy, Scott, you, it's going to be all right. And I just want you to think about this now. If those disciples had stayed with their thought and and been afraid of what they thought was a ghost or been too afraid of of even it being Jesus to let him in the boat, what would have happened to those disciples? I venture to say they'd have drowned. What happens to you when you are too afraid of God to let him into your life? Some of you have this opinion, and I had it too, that God is this mean granddaddy in the sky that's just waiting to squash everything you want to do. I had a guy tell me, why does God hate everything that's fun? You know? And that's the way a lot of us feel, isn't it? I mean, that's what he told me. Why does God hate everything fun? Everything I think's fun, God hates. You know? That's, but that's the way we look. We think he's going to squash everything. You know? We willingly receive him. Man, and, and here's the thing. You're going to get to where, listen, listen, listen. You're going to get, when he steps in your boat, you're going to get to where God wants you immediately. Not where you want to be immediately, but where God wants you to be immediately. Okay? So, what's the point of this whole thing? Who was this? How did Jesus of Nazareth, Mary and Joseph's boy, just a carpenter, you know, made great tables and swing sets, you know, how was he able to uh, perform this amazing nature controlling out of the ordinary miracles? Guys, it was because he was God. He was God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. He was God with skin on. Okay, this was fully God, fully human. And this sign right here, I believe, and John believes, is, the, is exactly pointing them to the fact to say, I am God with skin on. And guys, it's not just for those 12 guys in that boat. It's for you and your boat. God has come, Jesus has come to you today saying, I am God. I am God. And to be honest with you, we're faced with the exact same question that those 12 guys were faced with. What kind of king is this guy? What on earth? And I'm just going to tell you, listen, I'm going to tell you, Jesus is far greater than you or I could ever imagine. What we try to do, and it's a natural tendency in human beings, is that we try to... um, to humanize stuff that we can't humanize. Like we say, the hand of God. We don't know what the hand of God looks like. God might not have a hand. You know, but that's the only way we can say it. You know, that's the only way we do. So we, we, we can't even, God is, Jesus is so much greater than we could ever dream or imagine. And listen, his claim on your life is bigger than, than the box you want to put him in. It's bigger than our minds can grasp. We like to just make Jesus, like I said last week, we like to treat Jesus like he's a mascot. Okay? Or we like to treat him like he's a spare tire. Okay, I know he's, you know, I know it's in the trunk, I won't pull it out until I need it. That's the way we approach Jesus as a spare tire. Guys, this is Jesus. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And this is the guy who can tell a storm, quit it, and it will. And he's the, and, and see, right there in your mind, you just thought wind and waves. 
He is telling your cancer storm, quit it, and it will. He is telling your uh, relational storm, quit it, and it will. He is telling your financial storm, quit it, and it will. He is telling your spiritual storm, quit it, and it will. It has to stop in the name of Jesus Christ. It has to. So, so quit playing... Ma- Mamby Pamby, is that a good word? Casper Milk Toast, I don't even know what that means, but my grandma used to say that. I think it means kind of sissy, okay? Quit being a sissy with Jesus. Let the King of kings and the Lord of lords buck you up and put you up there. He's saying, man up, woman up, here we go. And you hold on because it's going to be a ride like you ain't never seen before. But you're going to be laughing all the way. Your stomach going to be up. It's kind of like riding that uh, some kind of, I can't remember what that roller coaster was we rode up at uh, up somewhere up north. But it was like my stomach was like way up here in my head and out, coming out my ears and all this kind of stuff. But we were laughing the whole way. That's the ride with Jesus. Folks, quit. Oh, man, we just, we're just, the line's too long. I don't want to get in that line. That's the way we do it at Carowinds. That's what we do with Jesus. I'll just wait. And Jesus said, you come on, I got a spot for you in the front seat and you're going to giggle. We ready to roll. That's what he's saying. And here's, this, guys, this is the great I am. The saint, The same God that spoke to Moses through the burning bush says exactly the same thing to you individually. And we think it was a great deal that he talked to Moses. He talks to you like that every single day. Every single day. So do... What do we do with this Jesus guy? And that's my question for us today. What do we do with this Jesus guy? Do we worship him? Do we fall on our face in front of him? Do we say, you know, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere? Or do we say, I'll just stay over here in my boat and fight the storm? Guys, that's your choice. That is your choice. Do Faith is this mindset that expects Jesus to work, okay? Now listen to me. Faith is that mindset that expects Jesus to work. But when we act on that expectation, that's when your fears subside. Some of us have faith in Jesus, but we don't act on it. We don't act on it. That's when the fears subside, when you act on it. The disciples had just seen Jesus do a bunch of miracles, excuse me, had just seen him feed 20,000 people with a happy meal, and they still could not take that final step of faith and, and understanding and believing that that was God's son. If they have, they wouldn't have been amazed that he was walking on water. One of them would have probably said, hey, Jesus will meet us out there in the middle. He might have another happy meal for us. Who knows? He'll meet us out there. Come on, let's go. Okay. But here's the thing. They did not transfer the truth they already knew about him into their lives. And that's what we do. We do not transfer the truth of this, work, this book right here. We do not transfer the truth of this book into our lives. I'm reading a great book right now. Y'all know my history now. I'm reading a great book uh, called The Day It Rained Patriots. And it's about the Revolutionary War in the upper South Carolina area. I am loving it. I can't put it down. But guess what? It ain't changing my life one iota. What them crazy Presbyterians did from, from Fishing Creek Presbyterian Church, God bless them. The British called, thought every, uh, every uh, uh, wig, every, every person uh, who lined up with America, they thought they was all Presbyterians. They called them, Cornwallis called them Presbyterians. That's what he called them, okay? 
Thank you, Presbyterians. That's pretty cool. But anyway, it's all about that. you know. But listen, man, what they did up there, the battles that took place, the Battle of Huck's defeat that they just reenacted yesterday, the Battle of Anderson's Old Fields right up yonder in, uh, in Great Falls, the Battle of all these other battles right over here. Guys, they are not, they not, reading about that don't change my life one bit, but reading about this right here changes my life minute by minute. We have to apply this into our lives. We have to transfer it into our lives. We, we cannot only believe that these miracles took place, but we have to apply that and transfer that faith and that trust in, into our own life situations. Mark Batterson says, Faith is that sixth sense that enables us to perceive the impossible. I don't know what God's telling you to do today. Some of you, you know, maybe in a storm, I don't know what its situation is. Some of you may hear, say, Scott, I, I, I don't even know this Jesus guy. I might have seen him one or two times. I don't even know this guy. Well, listen, that's okay. That's what this church is for. That's not the issue there. The issue is if you leave here and still don't know him. Some of you came here today with your mama's faith, your grandmama's faith, your daddy's faith. Listen, that's all good and well, but that ain't what Jesus is asking. What is your faith? Do you have faith in him? Some of you right now, just to say, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, and if you love me the way you say you do, then I'm asking you to get in my boat. And I'm going to turn the oars over to you and I'm going to trust you to get me where you want me to be. Some of you need to say, in addition to that, you need to say, I believe that you lived, that you were crucified, and that you took my punishment, and that you were a substitute for me. And Jesus, I believe and I thank you for the forgiveness of sin that you purchased on the cross. I thank you for the healing that you purchased by your stripes. And Jesus, I want to take what I know and apply it to my life. I'm with you for the long haul. Some of you might say, yeah, I've been a Christian for a long, long time, but I ain't got a clue what Jesus is supposed to do in my life. Maybe you just might want to say, God, I'm ready for you. I'm willing and ready for you to get in the boat, and I want you to get me where you know that I need to be. Some of you might just be saying, God, my storms are so big right now. I am totally overwhelmed. I'm at my wit's end. I'm at the end of my rope. And Jesus is saying, great. That's the best place to be if you want a miracle. I don't know what God's telling you to do, but you do business with God right now. If you want to talk to us, there'll be Cynthia will be right here. Cindy will be right over there. I'll be here. Uh, Jim will be right over there. We've got some folks in the back back there will be there. If you need prayer, listen, one of the things we do here is we pray. If you need prayer for, for your finances, your health, your relationships, whatever it may be, just come down and let us pray with you. Or some of you just might want to say, hey, I... I want to become a Christ follower. I'm ready to let Jesus in my boat. You can do that sitting out there. You can do it right up here. It doesn't matter. Whatever God's telling you to do, you do that right now. Holy Spirit, you are in this place. You are speaking clearly. Lord, let us, some of us are afraid right now of you, just like the disciples were. But Lord, let us see you as the great I am and understand that you are the I am and that your desire for us is greater than our desire for us. So Lord, let us trust you and apply that trust to our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand and sing.